hop in and get started. We are continuing our listing contract to close um, training that we started yesterday. Yesterday, we actually just talked mainly about like sign listing agreement to on market date is kind of where we got through yesterday. A couple of things I want to address there. And as always, if anybody has questions, I do have the chat box up. Um, I do have the participant list up. So I usually look for people to unmute themselves and you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me as well. I never count that as rude. So if you have questions, just feel free to, to go ahead and ask them. Um, on our list, oh, and let me put this um, uh, folder, the share link for the folder in the chat box for y'all. Um, but we had talked about in the pre-listing period, I kind of glossed over pre-listing inspections. And so I wanted to revisit that um, just for a moment. Um, I highly recommend getting pre-listing inspections done for a couple of reasons. Number one is at the very least, I usually recommend getting a pest inspection completed. And the reason for that is we are in a community that is very highly populated with VA buyers, right? Either um, active military or retired military. Um, and they require either a clear pest inspection or a Form 33, um, and there's a longer official title for that Form 33, but most pest inspectors know what that is. And that's basically just verifying, which was the heart of it from the VA. The heart wasn't like, hey, there can't be any dry rot or there can't be any like potential future damage like Section 2 items, which they usually require Section 1 and 2 if they see the full pest inspection. But the heart of the VA was really just, let's make sure there's no termites. California has a high frequency of termites and wood destroying um, ant like bugs. And we just want to make sure the property is free and clear of those. That was the heart of the VA. So now we can um, usually get a form 33. I would get a full pest inspection done um, with everything and then also ask for that form 33. And that form 33 just verifies that there's no active infestation of wood destroying beetles or termites or anything like that. So that's what that form 33 is. Most lenders will accept that for a VA loan now for pest clearance. So just kind of keep that in mind. So for pre-listing, I highly recommend, if nothing else, that pest inspection, just so you know what to expect. It alleviates that surprise um, when you go into contract with a VA buyer, you know exactly where the property stands, what the repair cost is, and whether we've got a clear form 33 or not. So very least pest inspection. My second choice for a uh, in pre-listing inspection would be a home inspection. And the reason that I recommend the home inspection is that it goes back to that alleviating any surprises. So if we have that home inspection, we know what's going on with the property. The thing with sellers, you would think, well, man, they live in the house. They should know exactly what's going on with that property. But the reality is they forget about things. They've been living with things for years that probably should have been fixed. And they kind of forget about stuff that buyers are going to be aware of and are going to show up on their inspections and reports. So by having a, a pre-listing home inspection completed, the sellers are now made aware of a little, um, any major items that are going to come up when the buyer's in contract or any minor stuff as well. And some of those minor things a seller may want to go ahead and repair and correct prior to going on market. Now, um, if the seller does that, you can um, put together a list of items of that have been corrected um, and attach that to your home inspection or even do like an addendum to the TDS or SPQ um, that you upload to that display or that home light listing management file so that people can go through the list and say, oh, this item was fixed, this item was fixed, right? So you have a whole laundry list of items that have been corrected. So those are my bare minimum. Um, bare minimum would be pest. Second would be home. Third would be roof inspection, um, only because a lot of buyers have a roof inspection done. And that's one of those things that usually carries with it a price tag. Gives your sellers the option to go ahead and remedy that prior to entering into escrow versus um, dealing with a repair request from the buyer. So when it comes to pre-listing inspections, um, those are my recommendations. You can choose to or not to have inspections completed. As you get closer to the Bay Area, it becomes a very common practice that um, pre-listing inspections are done versus the further north you get, the least likely you are to receive copies of those inspections and reports. So it's just a way that different areas do business. So anyways, I would recommend having them done 
Um, and the other thing is, is it helps sellers with disclosure, right? As I mentioned, sellers live with things for a long time. They forget about things that they probably knew about. Having those pre-listing inspections help disclose those items that the seller probably should have known about and disclosed. All right, any questions about that before I move on to our offers and in contract section of listings? All right, I did put a link to our listings folder in the chat box. If you need that again, just holler. Um, if you joined late or didn't see it, yeah, it may need to be reposted. So Abby can do that for us if you need it. Um, all right, so we talked about pre-listing, we talked about on market. The next section would be, hey, we receive offers on our listing. Um, we wanna review those offers and prep for seller presentation. I rarely ever send a full complete stack of offers over to my sellers, okay? And the reason for that is each offer is what, like 16 pages long and it becomes really cumbersome and overwhelming really quick. So usually what I do is I put it on the offer comparison sheet, which is now in that Google Drive folder. And this is listed as it is on the residential purchase agreement um, so that you can go through that, right? So it, even if there's one offer, I use this, you can highlight these, right? And then if you right click on the highlighted ones, you can hide those columns. And then so you can hide all the ones you're not using. And to unhide them, you just, again, highlight those columns and hit unhide then we have all of those available. So whether there's one offer or five offers, I like this spreadsheet because it makes it really simple for my sellers to um, take in the information in an unbiased way, okay? So um, I usually put all the details in on this form here, what's included, what's not included, who's paying for what, um, any other terms, summary and recommended response, right? So you can put that all in there. So that's usually how I submit offers to my sellers. And again, it just makes it for unbiased. And remember again, on our listing agreement, it states that we're not gonna submit buyer offer letters with the offers. So I usually don't even make sellers aware that we've received any buyer offers because then it becomes a personal decision versus a business decision. And they've hired me to help them make a business decision. Which offer do we think is gonna close? And which offer has the best terms and price, right? Which is the best for the sellers? Um, the other thing about buyer letters is not just that it becomes a personal decision versus, um, business, but it also has the ability to open you up for discrimination. So, um, just kind of keep that in mind. And then also up here, I don't put the buyer's names. I put the agent's name. Okay. Just to keep it completely business decision. Cause sometimes, um, uh, sellers may know a specific buyer or recognize their names. So I just put the agent's name up there. So this is the form that I utilize to be able to submit those offers. All right. So here we're going to review offers, prep for seller presentations. So I'm going to plug them all into that spreadsheet. I don't put them in in any specific order. Usually it's kind of the order that those offers were received. You want to make sure to call lenders to verify the buyer information. So if it's finance, you should have gotten a pre-approval letter. It's okay to ask for proof of funds and pre-approval up front. If you didn't get that with your offer, call the agent and ask for it. If you did get it, call those lenders to verify the buyer information. Have they actually physically reviewed the income and asset documentation and pulled credit reports on this buyer? Right, super important question. Have they actually physically seen them? Okay, because some lenders, um, you know, there's a whole discrepancy over what a pre-approval is versus a pre-qualification. And ultimately, the reality is it doesn't matter. But when we talk to that lender, we want to verify that they have actually viewed and reviewed the income and asset documentation and pulled credit. OK, even better if they're like, oh, yeah, in fact, we've already underwritten the file. Even better. We want to make sure that that buyer is able to move forward with that purchase and that the lender's willing to back up their letter that they sent over. The next step is to present those offers to the sellers. You can decide how you want to do this. Mine varies depending on my sellers. What do my sellers want? Do they want me just to email it over to them and go over it with them on the phone? Do my sellers want me to meet with them in person to go over the offers? So I leave that open to my sellers and what they're most comfortable with and what they would like to do. Once we've selected an offer, remember you always have the options. You can just accept an offer as is. You can counter one offer or you can do a multiple counter offers if you've received multiple offers and want to counter 
um, a couple of those at the same time. The multiple counter offer does not have to be the same for every offer, okay? Once we've made that decision, we're gonna send that offer and any counter offers over for the seller's signatures. Okay. Um, once we've reached a decision, we've, we've, um, you know, if it's a multiple counter offer, then what happens is this, we send the counter offer back, the buyer signs it and sends it back, but then we get to select which multiple counter. So the seller has to sign again. It used to be too that, um, everybody had to acknowledge everything, but we don't have to do that anymore. So now we're just here. So once we've got that fully executed offer, we just wanna make sure everything is signed and dated. And that's the residential purchase agreement, any addendums that were included, any counter offers. That brings us to being officially in contract. Dun, dun, dun. Here's a good opportunity to send those under contract postcards out, right? And I don't just recommend like, sending out a postcard that says in contract, like put out something because our goal is we're leveraging this listing for more leads. So we want to send out those postcards with like a story to tell, right? Like in contract in three days, in contract with multiple offers, in contract over asking, right? Whatever that is, spin that story to make you look like the hero so that other people want to list their homes with you. That's the goal with the postcards. Okay. Our goal is, remember, we, we sent out on market postcards. Now we're sending out under contract postcards. We're going to send out closed postcards as well. Our goal is to send them to the same households, the same people, so that you're touching those people around that house multiple times during that on market and in escrow process with the idea that multiple touches are going to make you more likely to get the listing. Because remember, somebody who can see that for sale sign is going to list their home. That's what our statistics say. Okay, so send out those under contract postcards. You can send those out through um, one design and you can, it'll actually select the properties for you. So you don't even have to come up with the addresses. Okay, we want to make sure to send accepted offers, counter offers, proof of funds, and pre approval letters to your transaction coordinator. We also want to send over any rejected offers to our transaction coordinator. Okay, in the MLS, we want to move that property to contingent. So remember, our property was active in the MLS, and then we move it to contingent as long as there's any contingencies in that offer inspection, investigation loan, appraisal, whatever it might be, sale of another property. If the that offer is contingent on anything, it gets moved to contingent. And in Barry's, we have the option generally of contingent show or contingent no show. Do we want to continue to allow showings or not? And then once all the contingencies are removed, or if you got an offer with no contingencies, instead of going contingent, it would go pending. Okay. We want to send our intro email over to escrow. And that's going to include copies of the contract and any counter offers and any addendums or amendments all go to the escrow. Um, let's see here. Uh, show versus no show. Oh, yeah. Check with agent. Um, let's see. Open escrow. If not done, ask to order NHD. Our escrow companies used to order NHD. Most of them don't order them anymore. You want to confirm closing date. Um, ask to order a home warranty if the seller is paying. Most of the time we do that now as well. And ask title if there's any HOA docs to order those HOA docs. So that's just the little notes over here off to the side. So that's your intro email to escrow. If they're using your escrow company that you've already opened pre-escrow with, it's not a big deal. We just want to shoot over copies of the contract. Um, you'll know whether they're going to order, you probably already have your NHD report, um, ask them if they can order the home warranty. And then also, again, um, just confirm all the dates that you have in that email and ask them to order those HOA documents. Okay. Also include or CC the uh, buyer's agent on that email so that number one, the buyer's agent has all the information. You've now confirmed all the dates with the buyer's agent as well. And they have copies of all the contract as well as the title and escrow information. So it's always a good idea to CC uh, the buyer's agent. Okay. Um, if we do that, then we can eliminate, eliminate uh, step 66, which is send completed offer or counter offer to buyer's agent with intro. I'll go over that in a minute. And then we're going to upload all that off the offer to Skyslope. 
Okay. So here is, we're going to go back to that listing email template. Email number seven goes to the sellers, right? Congratulations. Uh, the, the subject line is usually key information and dates for the sale of your home. Congratulations. We are in contract. Please make sure blank are completed. So if there's anything they haven't completed yet for disclosures, we want to make sure that is done. All of the disclosures, inspections, reports, and other documents will be loaded into Disclosures I.O. or loaded on Disclosures I.O. or Home Light Listing Management for you to access. You should have already received a link, but the link is also located below. You're going to input that link again. Below is the key information and dates in regards to this transaction. And we have actually like a little table that my transaction coordinator puts together. Um, on our spreadsheet, we just copy and paste that. It has the close of escrow date, um, any of the contingency due dates, anything my sellers need to do for that property. So anything in there that pertains to that offer with regards to dates goes in that grid for them so that they can keep track of that information as well. So that's what goes out to the sellers. Here's what goes to the title and the other agents. Um, listing agent introduction. And then you put the property address here. Congratulations, we are in contract. My name is Sarah Schuster, right? That was my transaction coordinator. I'm the transaction coordinator assisting Amy Fittard. Um, of Rog Fox, Fittard Riddle and Associates with the transaction on and then put the address there. Uh, please CC, that's where we put in the Skyslope email address to make sure that they include that email on all correspondence so we stay in compliance. And she puts her email there as well on all correspondence regarding this transaction, right? Um, agent name, uh, please let me know. This is where she puts the buyer's agent's name, right? Please let me know if you have a TC or a file specific email that needs to be included in correspondence. If confirmation, correct anything else and need to ask for it, right? So if there's anything else that we need, we put it in there. So this is where you put the buyer's agent's name to find out if they have a TC. Nicole or whoever title is, can you please order the home warranty information and or NHD here? So whatever needs to be ordered. And then also includes in the key dates for that contract. So the same grid that we sent to the seller also goes to the um, title and other agent as well. Okay, so any questions about those two emails? And you have copies of these in that folder. Okay, back to the transaction action plan. So that's what it's talking about. Send email to escrow, send completed offer or buyers to buyer's agent. You also, well, we don't have to worry about it on the seller side. So never mind. Upload all offers to Skyslope. We talked about that. Then we want to complete our agent visual inspection disclosure. Now, here's a little side point. Um, up on our pre listing, we talked about doing the disclosures. And on the TDS, the transfer disclosure statement, on the last page of that, there's a blank. Um, box that we have to fill out where it says that whether we're going to do an agent visual or whether an agent visual inspection disclosure is attached to that TDS or not. Okay. I was instructed by a, a attorney at one point to mark the box, the agent notes the following and put agent notes, nothing at this time on the transfer disclosure statement. And the reason that we do that is that if we mark the box that the agent's going to do an agent visual inspection disclosure, number one, you should not do that agent visual inspection disclosure until you enter into contract on that property because you're mentioning material defects of the property at time of acceptance. That's your best proof of the condition of the property when the offer was accepted, which is the way in which the sellers are supposed to deliver the property to the buyers. So I recommend not doing your agent visual inspection disclosure before um, before you enter into escrow, okay, do it after, but on that TDS that the seller completed before escrow, right, that week before we sent them that TDS to complete, we're going to mark the box, agent notes the following, there's some lines there on the lines, we're going to fill out, agent notes nothing at this time, okay, and that makes the TDS complete for your seller disclosures, Okay, so that it's a it's a completed document. If we check that box, it's not complete that we're going to provide an AVID. It's not completed until we actually provide the AVID. So here within 24 hours is usually what I recommend of accepted offer. We're going to get to the property and do that agent visual inspection disclosure. I highly recommend using Glide to do that. I did a training on that when I was actually in town last year. 
or earlier this year, um, I will do another one, but I highly recommend using Glide. It allows you to attach pictures. You can do it, uh, you can like voice text it, puts in all the lines. You're not um, then limited to what's on the, the, the spaces available on the agent visual inspection disclosure. It'll put on a uh, text overflow addendums and all sorts of things, makes it super easy to do. The other thing that I recommend is when we're completing our AVID is the goal of the AVID is actually to look for any material defects in the property. We're supposed to do a diligent agent visual inspection of the property. We don't have to open cabinets, um, turn on lights or anything like that, but we're supposed to just walk around and note any material defects right? Something that may affect the buyer's um, desirability of the property. In addition to that, I like to utilize it as my proof of condition of the property. So I make sure to take a picture of each room. And then I note things like, um, you know, nail size holes in walls or spots on carpet. Remember, we're not experts. So on that visual inspection, we're trying to stay away from being an expert, like in the carpet. Like we don't want to say it's a stain because we haven't actually like professionally tried to remove that spot. So we don't know if it's just a spot or it's with stain. Same thing with like on the ceiling, there might be like a uh, what we would assume is a water stain, but we're not professionals, we're a real estate agents. So we can just note that there's discoloration on ceiling or spot on ceiling, right? We can't mention that it's a water stain or a stain because we don't know, we haven't tried to get it out. So things like that. We also try to avoid things like large crack or small crack. We try to define it like pencil size crack, right? Or penny size crack. Like what, what is it or how big is the whole like use tangible item so that it's not um, subjective. Okay. If there's nothing to note in a room, I never put nothing to note. I will put no noticeable holes on walls or holes or scrapes on walls, no noticeable spots on carpet or on floor, right? So I'll put something like that so that it's obvious that I actually entered into that room. I just didn't forget about it and put nothing noted. Okay. So complete your agent visual inspection disclosure. Make sure you get those prelim and CCNRs. If you already got those pre-escrow, we don't have to worry about them. If not, we're gonna get those from the title company. The prelim's gonna come with the hyperlink CCNRs, take those off separately and upload them into that home light listing management file or get them over to the buyer's agent. Okay, I like to add the buyer's agent to the home light listing management file and let them know that that's where we're gonna include all of our disclosures and reports that we receive. Um, if you haven't already received that NHD report, go through that, make sure there's nothing scary on it. The seller does sign the NHD report or the natural hazard zone disclosure report. Make sure you confirm the information on the prelim. It should match what's on that listing agreement and who's listed as the sellers. Also make sure there's nothing scary on the buyer side of things. We're not super worried about the prelim. In fact, I had this question yesterday, uh, you know, on the buyer side, you're really just making sure that you know what easements are on the property and what's going to remain after the property is recorded. If you've got a, a lender on that and uh, you have a title company working on your thing, they're gonna make sure all of the liens and um, you know anything recorded against the property is cleared at the close of escrow. So I'm not super worried about that, but the things that remain afterwards are things like easements, like who has access to the property, your CCNRs, things like that that are recorded against the property are going to remain. So on a buyer side, that's what you're really worried about. On the listing side of things, you're making sure that nothing's popped up that was unexpected. Was there a lien on there that you didn't know about? Is there a tax lien? Is there a judgment? <coughs> Is there a solar loan that the sellers told you were paid was paid off, right? Because then we're going to have to get to the bottom of whether it was actually paid off or whether it's still due. So we want to make sure names match. We want to make sure there's nothing scary or unexpected on there, that there's not somebody listed as an owner on the property that isn't on the listing agreement. Now we have to track down. The other thing that you're going to run into problems with, um, Adriana is a big uh knows all about this at this point, I've also run into one, is if the previous transfer of the property, the previous sale was done and it wasn't done through a title company and there wasn't title insurance issued, that's going to be an issue on this sale, okay? Because the title company is hesitant to insure a transaction where the previous one wasn't insured. They're going to want to track down that previous seller and have them sign an affidavit saying that, yes, in fact, they did um, transfer the property to these buyers or what would be now the sellers. So just kind of keep that in mind if the previous sale was uninsured. So we want to confirm that information on the prelim. Send additional disclosures to sellers or listing agents for signatures. So anything that's come up now that needs to be
trying to get those over to the seller and listing agents for signatures so that we can kick those over to the buyer's agent. Because remember, we have a time frame on that contract of how many days we have to get seller disclosures over to the buyers and we need to adhere to those time frames. So those are the things like the NHD, the AVID and anything additional. Confirmed selling agent has reviewed the DIO file. Remember here, the selling agent is the buyer's agent. Okay, so make sure that they've actually opened that up and reviewed it. Hopefully they've also sent that information over to their buyers. <laughs> um, and we want to make sure that uh, that DIO file has everything included, including the full NHD report, the prelim, the CCNRs, and HOAs documents. We want to confirm inspection dates and times with selling agent. So if we haven't heard from the selling agent in a day or two after uh, accepting that offer, we want to reach out to them and say, hey, do we have a date and time? Are the buyers conducting any inspections? And do you have dates and times for those inspections? Right? We just want to reach out and be proactive. Um, I like to input my inspection timeframes into showing time so that the sellers have record of those and can look back and reference that calendar that's included on that app of when those timeframes are to make sure they don't miss them. And usually if my, um, if you, we, we usually assume that the home inspection is going to take about two hours, a pest inspection is usually like 30 minutes to an hour, a roof inspection usually doesn't even get put on the calendar because they usually say, oh, we'll be there sometime during the day. But most other inspections are like 30 minutes and I'm going to usually buffer that just a little bit. So if it's a home inspection, I'm probably going to mark it for like two and a half hours. Um, everything else probably give it an hour. Okay, so just so we make sure that the seller's out. I don't want the seller's home during inspections. Number one, buyers are often there during inspections. You should make your sellers aware of that. And number two, I just don't want my sellers interacting with the other party. And that inspection process for a seller who loves their home can become very personal and they can get very defensive really quickly. And so I'd like them not to be there. Okay, the inspector's job is to pick apart their house and the seller's going to be sad about that. Um, I'm going to complete my appraisal packet prior to appraisal. So that's that ASAT appraisal class that we're going to host um, in two weeks. We'll talk about what that appraisal packet entails and what that looks like. But I do that so I always meet with the appraiser <coughs> at the appraisal to hand them that packet of information to help ensure that my property is going to appraise at the value we're in contract for. We want to make sure to remind the buyer's agent of any investigation contingency deadline and to return all of the signed documents back to us. So I usually do that five days before the deadline and then again one day before as well. Okay. Um, make sure you get any inspection copies. So as they have inspections completed on the property, you are um, allowed to and they are required to provide you a copy of any inspections or reports done on the property on behalf of the buyer. The main reason behind that is those now become material facts regarding the property. Okay. Um, we want to review returned disclosures for completeness. Remember, that's a time frame in the contract that the buyer has to abide by is getting back all the signed seller disclosures. They have to sign them and send them back. Um, so we want to make sure we review those, make sure the buyers signed and dated and, and initialed each and every page and line that was supposed to be. And then we can request corrections if necessary. We're going to negotiate any repair requests or extensions of time, et cetera, right? Any amendments to the contract. Keep in mind that once we're in contract, any changes should be done on an AEA form. That's an amendment to the existing agreement. So if the buyer's agent sends you over an addendum for a credit, that's not the right form. Ask them to send it over on the correct form. Um, and then we're going to schedule any repairs if necessary. Okay. We're going to remind the buyer's agent of the appraisal contingency deadline and the loan contingency deadline, again, usually five days before those deadlines, and then also one, again, one day before. Again, you know, keep in mind, too, that if you're five days before that appraisal contingency is due and the appraiser hasn't been to the property, that's probably going to be an issue. You're not going to meet that time frame. So then it becomes a, instead of reminding them to remove it, uh, contingency or asking them if the appraisal has been returned, then it becomes a, hey, buyer's agent, we have yet to hear from the appraiser to schedule that appraisal. Do we know what's going on with that? I'm also probably going to make a call to the lender 
to check in with them to let them know that the appraisal has not yet been scheduled, okay? Because that should be done. If it was an FHA or a VA loan, we can request a copy of that appraisal. Contractually, they're required to give you a copy of it because that's gonna stay with the property. Or if they've asked for repairs that are, um, the appraisal is contingent on repairs or subject to repairs, even if it's conventional, you can get a copy of that appraisal report um, for that repair purpose. Okay, if it's just a regular conventional deal, no repairs were requested as part of the appraisal, they are not obligated to give you a copy of the appraisal. We're gonna make sure we upload inspections and appraisal to our disclosures IO fire our home light listing management file. And then once they've removed all those contingencies, we can then change the MLS to pending, right? Once the contingencies are removed, that's when we go to pending and they should, um, those contingencies have to be removed in writing. So remember, you should get a contingency removal form. If you do not get one and you are on the due date for that contingency, you should be serving a notice to perform to the buyer's agent to make sure that they get you that contingency removal form. You can let them know it's not personal, it's just part of doing business and protecting your seller, but that's just doing your due diligence. Or if at any time you've done this um, reminder, you know, five days before for that contingency removal, and then one day before or two days before, and you don't feel like they're going to remove the contingency, you can serve those notices to perform up to two days prior to the due date of that event. Okay. And again, that's just protecting your seller. Or if you've got a better offer that you received after the one that you accepted, there's lots of ways to um, kind of push the envelope a little bit to try to get out of the existing offer to move forward with a better offer. Okay. Any questions so far up to the accepted to pending? What does DIO stand for? Sorry. Sorry. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, a home light listing management, HLM, it should be updated. So DIO, here, let's put that in parentheses. It used to be called Disclosures IO, and then they changed the name to home light listing management. So all of my original paperwork, in fact, even when I talk, I still say, say DIO or Disclosures IO, and then I have to correct myself all the time. But that's that home light listing management file that we talked about yesterday that you can access through Barry's, where you can put all of your disclosures and reports. So anytime you see DIO, it's really HLM, Home Light Listing Management. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Once we move to pending, once all those contingencies have been removed, just so you know, too, like how I operate as a buyer's agent is completely different than how I operate as a listing agent. So when we talked about our buyer transaction and we went through this, this purchase list, Remember we talked about like, oh, you've got to remove contingencies and you got to do this and that. And I said, oh, I drag my feet on contingencies. Like if I, if the listing agent will let me, I won't remove contingencies until we're like ready to close or at closing, right? But as a listing agent, I want to protect my seller. So if the agent isn't giving me those contingency removals or we're not having good conversations where I feel like that's moving in the right direction, you better believe that they're going to get a notice to perform to get those contingencies to remove because I want to lock those buyers in I want to make them make a choice and lock them in, or we want to move on with a new buyer. Like we don't want to just be sitting out there dragging on and on forever and have this become a two and a half month escrow that was unnecessary. So, so we want to kind of get that ball rolling and moving along. Once we move it to pending and all the contingencies have been removed, then we can feel pretty confident that we're going to hit our dates for the close of escrow and that everything is on track from that point. So at that point, I, if I've had staging, we're going to schedule that staging removal. I'm going to order this sign removal for the close of escrow date, right? So we might be 10 days before the close of escrow, but we can go ahead and start making these phone calls and scheduling these things to happen. I'm going to send any um, contingency removals or disclosures to the sellers and listing agent myself for signatures. Keep in mind that the contingency removals no longer require acknowledgement on the seller's side. I actually don't like that. Um, so I usually have my sellers just go ahead and initial the contingency removal forms just so they know that they've received them and seen them. I just think it's good practice. I'm sad that they took away that, that option. So I do think that those should be acknowledged. 
Um, and then sometimes like the buyer's agent has an agent visual inspection that they send over, or there might be additional buyer disclosures and stuff that need seller signatures on them. So now's the time that I get all of those signed. I'm going to send all the signed contingency removals and disclosures back to the buyer's agent, right? So we send them for signatures. We get them back. We send them back to the buyer's agent. I'm going to upline, uh, upload all of those signed documents into Skyslope. At this point, we're going to make sure that we have our commission demand requested, and we're going to double check it for accuracy. We're pretty confident that the price that we're in contract for is now what we're closing for and that everything's been taken care of. You're going to send that demand over to the title company. And any invoices that you have for payment, whether it's for photos or repairs or um, the NHD report, whatever that might be. Also, we can send those over to the title company for payment as well. And those can get paid through the close of escrow. We're going to prep our sellers for signing. So that means that we are going to communicate with our sellers to determine their signing location, whether it's going to be a title company, work, home, etc. The date that works for them. Sellers can sign really at any time. So once we go pending, it's a good time to go ahead and get those sellers in and get them signed so that we're not holding up that transaction. And so then we communicate with our sellers. Hey, when do you prefer to sign? Day, morning, afternoon, evening? Where do you want to sign? And then I'm going to kick that information over to my title company. Say, hey, the sellers would like to sign on Monday at 8 p.m. at the, the property address. Can you please arrange that? Here's their numbers for confirmation. Then they're going to schedule a mobile notary to go out there and they're going to arrange that directly with the sellers and then confirm with me once that has been done. You want to make sure to review the estimated settlement statement from the title company before that signing takes place. We just want to make sure that the sales price looks right, that any credits going to the buyers are shown, <coughs> that any invoices that were supposed to be paid are on there so that everything looks accurate, that your commission looks right on there. So we're going to make sure we do that. If you're going to have your sellers complete a seller satisfaction survey and have that done through their closing package, we're going to make sure that title has a copy of that. And then you're either going to attend your seller signing or be available. Again, I'm not um, a, an advocate any longer of actually attending every single closing. I don't think that's necessary. Um, as long as you've supported them through the whole process. But I usually do reach out to my sellers and let them know that, hey, um, I know that you're signing tomorrow evening at eight o'clock. I'm not going to be there in person, but I am going to make sure that I have my phone on and available in case you have any questions or need anything. Um, I'll be available on my phone to answer those questions, right? So I just make myself available for them. Then we want to make sure we review our file for completeness because our goal is that as soon as we close, we want to get paid. So we want to make this file as complete as possible. Also, it's much easier to get things from the buyer's agent in the escrow period than after the close of escrow. Once everybody has signed, we want to do an officially closed email to our phone call to our sellers, right? Let them know. Usually it's a phone call. Congratulations, we're officially closed. Um, keep in mind too that it's not mentioned on here that we want to make sure that um, the sellers are out of the property or moving out of the property, that everything's on track. So we want to remind them of that process. I usually at some point will remind sellers that, hey, just you know, contractually you're required to provide the or, um to provide the property. Um, it should be free of any trash or debris. It should also be swept clean. So as you're cleaning out cabinets or areas like wipe them out, sweep or vacuum the floors, wipe down counters, it does not have to be professionally clean, but you're welcome to if you would like, okay? So just some things to think about there. And if at any point we are not getting contingency removals or I'm not getting straight answers, I'm checking in with that buyer's agent. I'm checking in with their lender on a regular basis. You have the right to call the buyer's lender at any time to get an update. Okay. So we want to make sure it's on track to close. <coughs> any questions on that pending to closed? Everybody's good. All right. Once it's closed, then we want to change it to closed or to sold in the MLS. So now we're going to move it from, right, we were active, then we went contingent, then we went pending, now we're going closed. You're going to have to input the other agent's information if there were any concessions paid out to the buyer for any reason. 
um, and the close of escrow date. So all that, the type of financing, all that stuff will be required when you move it to sold in the MLS. We don't make sure our Skyslope file is complete and accurate. We're gonna input that closed sale into Zillow. So most of the time our listings are automatically linked as long as you have an account inside of Zillow, which you can create a free agent account in the agent hub there with Zillow. Um, because you put your license number in there, it usually pulls from the MLS and updates the information as the MLS is updated for closed listings. So we just wanna double check that that's been pulled over or we wanna claim that. You wanna make sure to remove the lockbox. You wanna make sure that in your CRM or your contact relationship manager or your database, that you move that transaction over to closed or that you um, also update the seller's information in your CRM with the new address because now they are moving. If, uh, well, we'll come back to that in a minute, um, set up a sold touch campaign, right? How are you gonna interact with that property now that it's sold or with those sellers? Where did they move to? What's the plan? Send a thank you card to the seller. Send a thank you card to the selling agent, right? The buyer's agent. Send a thank you card to the buyers. You have that address because they're moving into your seller's property. And then send out those just sold postcards. And just like I said on the under contract postcards, the goal is these are going to the same people that we sent the other two postcards to. And we want to tell our story, not just that the property sold, but something amazing that you did as part of that transaction that would make them want to list with you instead of somebody else. Okay. Um, deliver closing gift. I usually do this about a month after close of escrow. One month. And we'll talk about how to um, next or in two weeks, we're talking about how to create clients for life. We'll talk about um, this process, but I usually don't deliver their closing gift at the close of escrow. Although with sellers, sometimes they're leaving the state, so it might be easier or Keep this in mind, I'll make you your hero to your sellers. If for your listing transactions, you give your sellers the gift of a trash haul at the close of escrow, I guarantee you will be their favorite agent for the rest of your, their lives, okay? If you're just like, hey, anything you don't want at the end as you're trying to finish up packing, right? As they're getting ready to pack and move, whatever that date is, um, I'm gonna have somebody come and haul that away from for you. For the most part, like it's gonna be a couple hundred bucks. Okay, it's not going to be super expensive. It, check with your tax or your accountant because it should be a write-off because now it's a contract. It's a, it's actually a marketing cost, um, but your tax accountant can walk you through that. Um, but if the seller knows that all they have to do is throw everything into a pile in their driveway or in their garage and anything that doesn't fit in their truck or anything, you know, you get to the last minute and you're like, I've just got junk left and gosh, it doesn't fit in the trash can because that's full and over flowing. So I guess now I have to pack it in the boxes and take it with us and deal with it when we get to the new house. If they know again, they can just chuck it in a pile and somebody's going to come pick that up for them. You will become their hero. I promise you um, make friends with some junk people that will do hallways and just schedule that ahead of time to let them know your sellers that, Hey, here's your closing gift. Like, because you hired me to, to sell this house for you. Once you get ready to move, just throw everything you don't want into a pile and I'll have somebody come and pick that up and haul it away you'll be, they'll be amazed. I promise. Um, archive that HLM file, the home light listing management file. I usually wait about a month to do this as well um, to make sure that your sellers or the buyers or whoever um, have access to those documents in case they need something else or want copies of the photo from there or the inspections or who knows, people are sentimental. Okay. And your zip forms, you can move that cl to closed as well. So it doesn't show up in your active transactions. You want to make sure to update the addresses in your CRM and go ahead and add those buyers into your CRM as well. You have your buyers names, you have their address, add them into your database. And you're like, Amy, why would you ever do that? Because buyers get orphaned, right? We know the National Association of Realtors statistics are that only like I, I don't remember the percentage. It's really low, the percentage of, of um, clients that use the same agent again. And that's usually because they get what's called orphan. Their agent never follows back up with them again. They sell them a house and then poof, they're gone. So you want to be there for those buyers. Okay. Also, right? Like you, your sellers know that house. So it's a good time to like, even two weeks after the close of escrow, go knock on the buyer's door and just be like, hey, I was a listing agent for this property. I just wanted to touch base with you. Is everything going okay? Did you figure out how to work all the systems and components? Um, 
And did you make sure you got, I just wanted to make sure your agent got you the home warranty information, right? Oftentimes the sellers pay for the home warranty. So that's a fair question to ask. So go knock on their door and like become their best friend. Okay. And that's going to bring you to the end of the close. Now, the other thing that might throw a wrench in this is if you've got like a seller in possession, then some of this stuff may be slowed. Okay, so if the seller's remaining in possession after the close of escrow, then we're still going to change to sold. We're still going to complete our sky slope and put the right, all this stuff, remove the lockbox. Well, you may leave the lockbox on until the seller actually delivers possession. But after the seller delivers possession, then we want to make sure to remove that lockbox. Um, we also want to make sure that the sellers get a deposit back if there was a deposit held. So we want to make sure that key transition happens very smoothly and nicely and that our sellers get their deposit back, their delivery of possession deposit. I usually try to make sure that I walk through a listing of mine right before the close of escrow so that I know the condition of the property so that I'm not surprised when the buyer's agent goes to deliver keys and they're like, oh, there was a whole pile of trash left in the living room. So now we're going to have somebody come haul that away and we're going to charge you $300 for it. I don't want to get surprised by that. So I usually walk through the property before keys, before delivery of possession time so that I know the condition of that property and I can fix or remedy any issues that are going on before the buyers show up to get their keys. Questions, thoughts, ahas? The link to this materials is in the chat box. So if you want a link to the listings, Google Drive folder that I've created that has the um, listing input questionnaire, the listing em email templates, listing information. Oh, um, if you don't like the Google form questionnaire, there is this um, other form in that drive. So hold on, we'll open that up. But it's basically... It doesn't go into as detail as that Google form for the listing input, but it does collect all the seller's information, the communication form, who is their contacts, birthdays, phone numbers, emails, kids' names, pets. Do you know your forwarding address? Um, during business hours, what's the best way to contact you? Evenings, weekends, what's the best way to contact you? If we have a document for signature, do you want electronic signing? Come to our office or email. Um, what are your favorite or most important features of the property, interior and exterior, community, any items that are screwed or nailed, right? So this talks about those attachments. Installed appliances stay with the home. This includes, right, utility information, HOA, and then your listing team. So there is a paper copy of that Google form to get the basic information for you in that folder, that's what that document is. If you're sending out the in listing input questionnaire, you don't need that form. Um, copy of the marketing calendars in there, copy of the offer comparison form that I went over today is in there, the listing email templates and the um, action plan, which we've been going over is all in that folder. Make sure to log your attendance. Does anybody, did you guys find this useful and helpful? Yes, very helpful. Good. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Everything you do is helpful and knowledgeable. Thanks, you Anastasia. Are you are you appreciated. Are appreciated. <laughs> All right. There will be no class tomorrow because it's Friendsgiving in the office and no uh, trainings next week because of it's Thanksgiving week. So we'll be back on November 28th. Thank you for the amazing graphic, Abby. That's fabulous. So no classes tomorrow or next week due to Thanksgiving. And we'll resume the week after. Okay. Fabulous. If anybody needs anything, feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks, Amy. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, Amy. Uh, the yep. spreadsheets are awesome. Good. I'm glad you like them. <laughs>